Hey guys, good morning. Welcome back to our Bible study in the book of Romans. And you're probably saying, but Jason, it's not morning. Yeah, I know. It's just my catchphrase, you know, at this point. So I just kind of go with it anyway. So let's just work on that together, can we? All right. Hey guys, it's great to have you back. I'm sorry to be late, kind of like getting into us this week, but this would be a bad week for you to get legalistic with like, you should have had this posted at 9 a.m. Sunday morning. Obviously, through powers of internet and other things that happen, sometimes that's not always possible. And as always, the fact Sunday's getting fuller and fuller to me is a good sign, if anything. But I do apologize for those of you in particular who like to have this for your Monday morning drive, but it's great to be back with you. So as we move in through Romans, you know, we've kind of reached this point where it's been, Paul's been giving us instruction. And Paul's been helping us out essentially on how to be a Christian. He's literally been helping us with how to be a Christian. And so as we roll into chapter 14, and we're probably not going to get very far, the temptation that you know I had going into this is like, you know, chapter 14 is so straightforward. You know, I feel like we should be able to just go all the way through chapter 14 in one single night. And I got into it, and I was like, you know, but chapter 14 is literally an area where we're doing one of the worst jobs as a church uh, and as Bible teachers and preachers. And so for me, it was like, I feel like we need to take a little bit more time in chapter 14 and really think about it a lot. And I'm going to ask you to pray heavily as we go through this chapter as well, because it is the chapter... That's what's tearing churches apart. So anyway, as we get into it, first turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. And I want to read that to get started because as we head into a chapter on unity in the church, let's maybe first see what Jesus said about this subject. So here we are, Romans 18, verse 6. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Uh, Father God, we ask God, if you would, to be with us in the study, God, to uh, help me, God, to be approved to break open your word today, God. And uh, help us, me as well, God, to learn and grow, God. And that's all we're after, God, is to learn and to grow, God, so that we're not we're not babies and we're not on the milk anymore. God, we love you and we thank you for this word. In your name we pray, amen. I did this in particular because one of the things that's, you know, we've been talking about a lot in our Bible study, you know, I keep saying you've got the believer the unbeliever, and then the make-believer. And one of the things that maybe sometimes we've got to take into consideration where, with the make-believer side, maybe there is more believers, but then you have to look at Paul's done something. Paul's broken down the believers for us. And in the category of believers, Paul has broken them down, broken them down into the group of the strong believers and the weak believers, and and we'll really go into that. And so, one of the things we look at here, and we saw we saw Jesus speaking in in Matthew chapter eighteen, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me. So here, when Jesus says, "Whoever causes one of these little ones," the little ones doesn't refer to, to children at all, but he's referring to those who do believe in him. So we're looking at immature Christians, the ones that are new possibly to the faith or just haven't been. We'll talk about more of that in a second. What exactly is the weak Christian? But regardless, we're still talking about those who believe in him. So it is believers. And so we've got this terrible habit in churches in the church today is we have people come in. We have people come in, receive Christ, and then... We the, the phrase in the church is you dunk them in the water and chunk them in the pew. That's the expression. And that's it. Uh, and, and it's like a fish out of water left, this new Christian left to fend for itself. 
and they've got no direction and no guidance. I can remember the very night that I was saved. I immediately, I immediately got in a vehicle and I drove about 45 minutes to the nearest Walmart. By the way, it turns out there's one 25 minutes away. I just hadn't lived here long enough to know that yet. So I drove twice as far almost, I guess, to go buy a Bible because I didn't have one in my house. But that was like that very first thing as a new believer, I wanted to instantly go have a Bible in my house. I wanted to go read that night. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I wanted to know more. And now, note to self, anybody in our church watching this, we need to buy Bibles that we're readily able to give out to people who get saved, or we need something. All right, you got that? Somebody make that note. Get back with me next week. We need to make sure and take care of that. They shouldn't have to drive 45 minutes. But I was hungry for the Word, and I wanted to know more, but I think back to how little I knew at that time. I mean, I had this basic understanding and for me, because of the mess I had been in, I understood the debt, I guess, a little bit, but I had nowhere near the comprehension of the debt that, that I owed to Christ at that point. And so here we see Jesus taking up for these little ones who believe in me. And he says, for those who would lead them into sin. And, you know, and I think about those who literally would the words we say and the words we choose and the life we live, we literally, we're executing the soul. I think that was from Al Pacino said that once. They're executing the soul of these young Christians because they come in and you may be wondering, how are we executing the soul over the gray matters? And so literally if we made a title for today, it might be life within the gray. Because we're looking at these matters where Scripture is not specific, where the Scripture is not gave you a just perfectly beautiful, clear outline of something. Uh, for instance, can I wear blue jeans in church? Even more than that, can I preach in blue jeans? We'll have to figure that one out, won't we? Is my hair touching my collar make me a sinner at this point? You know, there's these areas like this that, that we have these gray areas. And a lot of times it seems like uh, these weak Christians, these babes are the ones that we see. You know, I'll go it farther. Not only do we treat them terribly in what we say, they come into the church and they see us, supposedly the Christians, And it's funny, those are the things that we're usually fighting about with inside the church. Uh, Can the pastor preach out of a new King James Bible, or should he just be preaching out of King James? And I could only imagine if the pastor brings an NLT Bible. Somebody note to self, remind me to bring my NLT next Sunday. We're going to make sure and just blow all this out of the water. Amen. But these are the things we kill over. And as new people enter the church, they look around and they see this fighting. Think about I talked to somebody today that was out of church for 20 years, and they told me one of the reasons why they were tired of seeing the fighting. A born-again, saved believer, and he was literally just so tired of the fighting he saw within the church, he didn't want any more of the church. And so I want you to look at the condemnation passed by Jesus. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned to the depth of the sea. If that language does not put this into context for you, then I don't know what I can say today because apparently we're not getting it. Woe to the world because of offenses. So Jesus is saying, you know what? We expect the world to do this, you know, as a believer. And if you are a new believer, get ready, uh, you know, buckle up because the world is about to come at you and attempt to destroy you. Uh, The people that are supposed to be your friends, uh, the media, uh, everyone is out to get you. And then what we find out when we get into the church And then even those within the church are out to get you. 
And what's um, the most amazing thing? Sometimes it's the weaker Christians attacking the strong Christians and vice versa. It's the strong Christian attacking the weak Christians. Hey, guys, I'm going to throw this huge idea out. Maybe we need to stop attacking each other, period. Uh, we were just there in the last week where, where, where we were literally looking at what what would we say? Here he is. You shall not covet, and there and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up by saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Romans chapter thirteen, verse nine. Last week, shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's time we start showing love and stop killing people. So what Jesus goes on to say, and we're ten minutes in. We're not even in Romans fourteen yet. Huh, I'm home alone. Ah, sorry, couldn't help myself. But what Jesus is saying, hey, you know, we expect the world to battle with the Christians. But then he finishes up, but woe to that one who causes the offense. So in particular, you, brother, sister in Christ, if you're that one who loves to get on, be a sin sniffer maybe, I sin sniffer is the wrong word. But if you're that one who literally comes to church for the sake of picking arguments, finding obscure doctrines to fight over, literally come to church to pick a fight maybe would be a good way to put it. Or just literally make the young believer feel like you don't have any idea what you're doing here. If you're that person, woe to you. Woe to you and it would be better to have that millstone hung around your neck. And so for the introduction, let's move into Romans chapter 14. So in Romans 14, the very first word we see right out, receive one who is weak in the faith. And so this expression, receive one, prosa, and you know I can't say the Greek words, prosa lambano, prosa lambano, something of that nature. But the word in the Greek, I've got my little Greek Bible that you know that it's all interlinear literally means to receive or to embrace so to receive to embrace so imagine open arms or imagine even getting back to the root of the word more to lay i can remember what i remember the expression kata lambano that is an act when it was people laid hands on some of the disciples and so here prosa lambano we can kind of think of it not laying on of hands in the bad way but imagine reaching out how about this let's get in close group hug this morning okay y'all with me imagine this reaching in here is paul telling us we need to open arms reach out and we need to bring it you know what do i think of when i think about this idea of embracing i think instantly of what he's just told us to do and that's that we should be loving one another remember there were no chapter breaks when paul wrote so this is still we should be loving each other Therefore, because you should be loving, you should be with open arms. You should be reaching out to receive the one who is weak in the faith. And this doesn't mean like someone who's not a believer. Weak in the faith means they are in the faith. So this is a believer that we're talking about. But they're weak in the faith. They're tore up over the gray matters. And that's what we'll get into in a second. But not to dispute over doubtful things. And this is a good line to finish out. And I wish at church I'd done a little better with this. But not to dispute. In other words, you don't welcome in so you can be like, I got to fix all their doctrine. <laughs> this guy says he's saved, but he don't know nothing. Wait till old Jason takes care of him. That's what we do. And so that's specifically what Paul is instructing. Receive them. But don't bring them in for the point to argue with them. Now, it could be the other way around. It could be them wanting to argue with you. I accept that. And if that's the case, don't do it. You're not to be arguing with them. The goal is love. The goal is love. Say it seven times over and get back with me. The goal is love, not to dispute over. And, and my Bible says doubtful things. Now, it's actually interesting. The root word, I, I pulled it up, uh, dialogizamon, maybe? Uh, I know it comes from the root dialogizamay. 
And I think a better way to put it is, I think maybe if Jason Cole were saying this, some, some of the scriptures say not to dispute over opinions, but essentially not to dispute over debatable things. In other words, Paul is laying out at the head of what we call chapter 14 instructions on how to handle the gray things, the gray areas of Scripture, how to handle the things that are not spelled out verbatim, word for word, things you should do or things you should not do. In other words, commandments. So these are not commandments that we're looking at but how we should conduct ourselves over these gray areas. And y'all, let's just, if we could have an open conversation right now, it is the gray areas that's destroying the church. We've already said it. Should I wear a suit to church? The Bible doesn't say if I could wear a suit. What about can I wear blue jeans? What, What can I wear to church? And you know, interesting thing is in terms of you're looking at, and there may be more. Remember, I'm not like the world's great theologian here. I'm just a dude in his backyard, but I love the Lord. First Peter 5, 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. We just read this a few weeks ago when we talked about submission. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. And so there's one of the few things we even see about clothe. And the idea is not literally, I think we could take it from that, though. And I think the good way to look at it is how you dress in the church. Probably you should be dressing in a way that doesn't draw attention to yourself. Because remember, when we're at church, the idea is we're there to give glory to who? God, which means our eyes should be on God. Uh, hey, I'll be honest, like for me, I don't like anything that takes away from who God is. Um, driving by church today, I think we got the signs put up just this week and it's got my name on the church sign now. And I cannot actually say how long that's going to stay there. And I know that seems so like whatever, well, you're just being ultra like pious right now of yourself. No, I really not. And I think those of you that know me know that's not the case, but it really is the fact for me. It's like, I don't. I don't like my name. I don't like anybody's name. I don't I don't think we should ever do things around the church where, you know, it's, you know, hey, if you'll buy a brick for $500, you'll put your name on it, put outside the church, the $500 brick club. You know, I think the church is about Jesus and it's about our Lord and our Savior. And, and we should always be directing attention to him. And so in our dress, that should be exactly what? So I don't think it's necessarily like if you wear a t-shirt, but maybe if you do wear a t-shirt, you might need to think what is on that t-shirt. Essentially, I feel it should be as much as anything. You shouldn't be drawing attention to yourself. The end. And I'll leave it at that. And so like if you come to our church, you're going to see a lot of people in blue jeans. And there'll be some people in t-shirts. I'll usually be wearing a button-up shirt. I might occasionally sport a tie or something. But, you know, you're not really going to see it's not a case of drawing attention to yourself. So I believe that humility is a part of it. But we're full of these gray areas in the church. I said it a little while ago. What about the Bible? Can I use, did Paul ever say I have to use a King James Bible? You know, I think somebody told me Paul preached out of the King James Bible. Sorry, some of the old jokes are still some of the best jokes. But the thing is, we have fights over like the version of the Bible, and we could do an entire series on, I don't know how it would edify greatly, it would be educational to go through all the translations, and we definitely could. You know, what's funny, most of the time when people ask me, now, well, which Bible should I read? I usually just say, uh, the one you will read. Go go get the Bible that you will read. If you, if you literally can't understand it, then it's probably not the best Bible for you to be reading at this point. So, so having these arguments over these things and killing each other. I can remember I can remember when I first got saved. You remember I told you the story. I went to Walmart that night. The only Bible they had was this little uh, is a, a paperback. It was kind of cheaply made. 
a little paperback New King James Bible made by Nelson Publishing. But it was my Bible, and I loved it. And I can still remember the first time somebody came up to me at church and told me I needed to get a real Bible. And they pulled out their leather-bound King James Bible and was like, this is what you got to go get. And I ended up going, and I got me a King James leather-bound Bible as $100, of which I didn't really have $100 to spend for a real Bible at the time. Yeah. You know, do you wonder what's destroying our church today? We're being destroyed by these gray areas. Uh, can I have drums in the church? It's a good question. Somebody bring that up next week. Uh, I could, like, it's okay for me to bring my guitar, but I wonder if I bring an electric guitar. Is it okay to sing modern hymn songs, classic hymn songs, or should we only be singing psalms in the church? You know, my theory with all that stuff is if, if it's giving glory to God, I'm in, you know. Uh, I don't think we need anything that takes away glory from God within the church. And so that's always where the focus on what we, what we need to do needs to come in. You know, and it's all these things, and it really boils down to like the legalistic side of things and the rules we even bring in. And that's what it literally boils down to. A lot of times it's substituting rules into the church, and we're back to having this checklist. And if I meet the checklist, I'm going to go to heaven if I meet the checklist. And remember, we've defined it over and over. That's exactly what a religion is. A religion develops a checklist. And if you meet the requirements of the checklist, then you're good via the religion. And the problem with the checklist religion is you can always just alter the checklist. And that's the beautiful thing about the Word of God. It's never changing, and it stands true. So now we talk about all these things, and y'all, we could go on and on and on. Is this a sin? Is going to the movies a sin? Having a television in your home is that a sin? What magazines do you have? What radio stations do you listen to? We could just go on and on and on the list. Of, can the girls wear makeup? And I'll never forget because this is my favorite line ever by Pastor Chuck Smith from out in California. Uh, listen to thousands of hours probably of Chuck at this point. But Chuck Smith's response was always, if the barn needs painting, paint it. But what about it? Can Benny Tate, one of my favorite pastors out there, uh, Benny Tate from down in Milner, Georgia, Rock Springs, I love the story of his of his career. Started 20 people in 1994, and now he'll have four services of 1,000 people every Sunday. Uh, down there in Milner, Georgia, which I promise I've been there, is in the middle of nothing. But I can remember the time that uh, Benny told the story about how when he was still a preacher up in Tennessee, he got to meet his, quote, preaching idol at the time. Like, the preacher is like, I think every preacher has, like, the preacher that, like, they listen to the most and they're so influenced by. And now Benny would say it's Adrian Rogers, but we're rewinding back a long, long time ago. And Benny was telling the story about how the preacher came over to his house, he and his wife, and this preacher, his wife got out of the car, and the very first thing out of her mouth to his wife, Barbara, I'm going to stimulate the dip in my mouth. The first thing out of this pastor's mouth was, Bob, you going to hell for wearing them pants. What did Jesus just say? Maybe we need to quote it one more time because I don't think, I don't think we've got it down yet. I think we're still missing it. So hold on. I don't want to miss out on this. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and were drowned to the depth of the sea. Yeah, that's what he said. I'll never forget Benny telling the story because he said what was going on in the back of his mind was, Barbara's going to hell for wearing those pants. What about your dip? What about your dip? Are you going to hell for your dip? 
And so now we break into a whole nother level in church. What about cigarettes? What about alcohol? The list goes on and on. How about this? If we're going to start talking about, well, the cigarettes can kill you. It's bad for you. So would lunch at Billy Bob's Barbecue Pit every day would also kill you. One's going to make your arteries paper thin. The other one's going to completely clog them up. I was, <laughs> How about this? Here's a good example. So what about the person who's, you know, if, if we were in England right now or some other places around the world, it wouldn't be uncommon after the, quote, Sunday message might be to go out and actually have a pint. Have a, have one, imagine one pint of Guinness. Not getting drunk, just having a pint at the pub and literally the men of the church discussing the message of the day. This, it's what happened at my house just yesterday. And so what's interesting as we think about this, yeah, we had, oh, somebody's like, you were drinking beer with people at your house? No. <laughs> Sorry, maybe we need to get that right. But we had, I had some brothers come over here yesterday and we drank sweet tea and ate pizza and we did it. But if we were in England, it might very well be a pint of beer that everyone was having one of, not getting drunk and drinking. And around here, for us, where we live, we would look at that and be like, this is terrible. I can't believe that that's what the men of the church would be doing. And yet, how many of you kept it to 55 miles per hour today? In other words, are you keeping the law in every single area? Well, wait a minute. 55 miles, 70 miles per hour. Wait a minute. That, that's, 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 that's man's law. Yes, and we're still asked to withhold to hold ourselves to man's laws. So we're not, we're not any, man, we're just, we, fingers are just pointing all over the place today. So this is probably the point where we need to start saying, God, you, you need to give us a little bit of guidance here, especially 27 minutes in. Hey, we've read one verse. High fives, everybody. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. You know, I'm just... I'm so ultra spiritual. I believe that God would have us only to eat vegetables and not eat meat. So here is the one who believes, one believes he can eat all things, but now we've got another one who thinks he can only eat vegetables. It's not right to to eat an animal. What is the what is the answer here? Well, Paul Paul takes care of it. Verse 3, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. So now Paul now Paul pulls it back and he takes a look at it. And, and now he has to say, you know what? If you're the one that's the strong one in the faith and you're eating, don't look down. Don't look down. Don't talk bad. Don't criticize. And, and don't be the one who's eating the vegetables. Show a little compassion on your side and show a little good judgment on how you handle this brother. But now on the other side, if you're the one, let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. So if on the other way around, if you're the one who is not eating the meat, you don't judge and condemn the one, the other one. You don't judge the other. So neither one of you look down upon the other one. But wait a minute, which one of us is right, though? That's what we're at. Remember, we started it back off. Uh, Legizomai, the doubtful things, the opinions, these are not areas where there is necessarily someone that is right in these areas. And now I want you to look at something. Let's read it again. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. And here's your biggest word. For God has received them. Remember, what are we talking about here? We're talking about someone that is saved. 
So in that regard, for you to condemn one to another, it seems pretty shabby at this point when you consider, how can you not receive this person when God has received this person? You know, it's one reason why I might draw nobody Church of Christ get mad at me for, wait a minute, I'm lost according to Church of Christ, but like, one of the things, you know, I'd see is I look at somebody from the Church of Christ and, and, and they say they believe in Jesus and, you know, and and so from my standpoint, I, I receive them. I receive them as a brother because of their confession of their faith in Jesus Christ. But then what's interesting, they wouldn't receive me backwards simply because I was not baptized by an elder in their church. Jason, were you baptized? Yes. Were you submerged? Yes. Wait a minute. There's another good point. Should you be submerged or should you be sprinkled? I'm not really sure on this. It's cool. We don't have to fight over it. That's what's so neat about this. But from the Church of Christ standpoint, I'm basically a sinner because I haven't went through the requirements of their church to go to heaven. And that's where we start getting into exactly what Paul's been about for 14 chapters. And that's the concept of the Jesus plus theology. Think back to it in Romans chapter 10. How, do you, how is it we get saved? We are saved how? Saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Essentially calling Jesus Lord. And if you remember what that means, calling Jesus Lord, kurios, the very word means Lord of my life, meaning you went to Jesus and you said, you're the boss. Wherever you say go, I'll go. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I recognize that the show is not about me anymore. And so there's where we're at. God has received them, it says in chapter 3. Who are you to judge another servant? In other words, that other person, they belong to God. They don't belong to you. So where do you get off? being the one to pass the judgment on the one who does not even belong to you. And literally, the use of the word servant here in the Greek, oikos, I think I actually just pulled that out, but only because there's a yogurt, I think, that sounds very similar in the Greek. But oikos, I think, is actually the right word for servant. I could Bible hub it here real quick if I wanted to. But oikos literally means it is the servant within the household, there's different words like doulos and other things for servant, but here it's oikos. It's like the servant within the household. And so you're literally looking at, it's almost like family. When you look at the servant in a household, that's exactly what that kind of boiled down to. That person was in their family, just like we're in the family of God. And now the instruction to you is, who are you to judge this person who is in the family of God. To his own master, he stands or falls. In other words, you don't worry about holding that brother or that sister up. God's got this. God's got this. You need to back off your, I know everything about the Bible and I can correct everything with you. It is God who sees this person stand or fall. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. For it is God, and I love this, they, they use a take of the word dunamis here and is able. And dunamis is one of those, it comes back to me from the book of Acts, because it's where we get this, that power of God. It is God that has the power of to make this person stand. God is the one able to make this person stand. How dare you be the one to drag this person down because of your actions? Go hang the millstone around your neck. You know, if everybody that come into the church and tried to destroy the church got the millstone, we might actually have the church that, you know, we could actually be like, whoo, this is amazing. So, Jason, have you ever hung them, you know, have you ever? Yeah, I'm perfect. You know, I think the prayer should be in here for all of us. And it really goes back to how we open our mouth and how we look at everything. 
before this thing runs off that we call our mouth, we should take time to pray and we should think about what we say. You're preaching a watered-down gospel. Oh, you get out of here if you're going to dare say that. I haven't preached. I have. I, you can accuse me of a lot of things, but a watered-down gospel is one thing you, you can't accuse me of. Because, yeah, in the gray areas, we got to learn how to receive each other. But does that mean every area? No, 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 no. Sin is still sin. And there is a lot of things, fornication, adultery. There are a lot of things, idolatry. There are a lot of things laid out as sin in the Bible. And to those, it's no gray area. For example, we go back to how were you saved? Saved by grace through faith. The sovereignty of God is saved you. You didn't do it. God did it. If you're hearing this today and you're feeling conviction in your life, it's because God is the one doing it. You have the part where you can respond, but it is God working this. We can't bend on that. It is God that does the saving. It's not within yourself. We can't bend on that. God is made up of three persons, the Trinity. The Trinity of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In that, God in three persons, Christian, we can't bend. And this is where we look at things like Jehovah's Witness, and we got to say, get behind me, Satan. You remove the deity from Jesus Christ himself. If there's anything, we're going to see it here in chapter 14. Paul is going to preach the deity of Jesus Christ all through chapter 14. Uh, the Mormons remove the deity from Christ. I do not call you my brother because you're not my brother. God has not received you because you take away from his word and you take away the deity of his son. Ooh, I'm going to get in real trouble. Oneness Pentecostals who believe that there is a God, but he takes, sometimes he's Jesus and sometimes he's, Sometimes he's Jesus, and sometimes he's the Holy Spirit, sometimes he's the Father. That's not what the Bible says. God is three persons, because it's hard, so hard, I guess, for us to wrap our mind around. Yeah, explaining the Trinity is, we'll have to have a whole separate video on that, and maybe I can halfway take a shot at it. I know it's difficult, but it's real, and we sure don't take away from it. And those things we don't bend we don't bend in those areas. So Jason, tie this together. I'm just, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do in these gray areas? You know, I'm so glad you asked. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to flip there too. If I was good, I would have marked it. Go listen to one of those name brand guys. They're definitely better than me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, and we'll use this again next week. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. You know, I'm going to say, let's do this. Now let's go read verse 23 as well. So whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Now rewind back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. You need to evaluate all these things in your life. You need to, and we'll talk about more next week. We'll talk specifically about if the things you choose to do in the, quote, gray area, it might be, like, we'll talk about drinking more next week. If it causes another brother to stumble, it's not worth it. And even within your own life, what you've got to look at, does this help you? That's what Paul's saying. It's lawful you can have your glass of wine at dinner tonight 
And it's okay. That's right. Brother Jason just said it's okay. And, and we can talk about that more in depth. Having a glass of wine with your meals, not a sin. But the attitude that you have in those regards, and then you've also got to look at it in terms of is what you're doing beneficial to you or is it beneficial to others? Are you setting the example that you want to have for others? All things are, hey, I, I, it, it's okay. I believe it's okay for me to go in the house and go play a video game. But what if I play it for six or eight or ten hours till I'm sitting there? It's, it's, it's lawful for me to go into the house and watch a TV show right now. What if I binge watch and 12 hours later I'm still sitting there? I've already made it to season four. There's some part where we always say, work out your own salvation, the Baptist church, but it goes much beyond that. It means you need to, with the aid of the Holy Spirit in your life, you need to look at everything you do and see if what you're doing not only could hurt you but hurt those around you as well and so the prayer for me for you this week is a deeper level of thought of everything you, that you do of everything period and maybe that's just it awareness of what we do awareness of the others around us so that we're not and particularly awareness of how we handle the conversation with other people. You know, it's kind of funny. We, we always use expression, or we, the Scripture says that the devil is the one who goes about like a roaring lion, uh, seeking who he may, uh, seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. And in the church, I've seen people killed and destroyed so many times. Y'all, it's time we get back to the basics. It's time we get back to the simple command of really understanding what it means to love other people. Let's pray. God, we just thank you, God, for this week. God, we thank you for this word that you have for us. God, we just ask if you would to guide us and to instruct us, God, and and lead us. God, lead us, lead our mouths so that we don't say dumb things, God, so that we don't hurt others in the process. Let us be helpful when the opportunity is to be helpful, but God, keep us from being hurtful. God, we love you, and God, we thank you, and God, we give you all the praise, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, guys, love y'all. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you later. Bye.